This is a true crime podcast. It contains adult themes and content and may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. When a guard would stop and talk to you, you used to stand back and you would yell so people could hear what you were saying to that guard as they walked by or or within the vicinity. But he knew what a convict was going to do before they thought of it themselves. He'd just been around that long and uh, he was tough. They'd find uh, Sparky in about every conceivable place you could imagine, which we would, of course, dump. They'd wait until everybody was locked up, and he would open his door, run down to cell one, and get a bugler can full of Sparky and take it back to his cell. She had a kind of a hypnotic power. There were a great many wild cats around the penitentiary, and most people couldn't get near them. But she would stand in the doorway of the cell house and say, kitty, 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 and those cats would go to her. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a very special episode of Behind Gray Walls. This is our Stool Pigeon Saturday Halloween special. Tonight, Sky and I have three special guests on the show. Hey, Sky. Hi, Anthony. I am so excited for our very special oh. spooky Halloween episode. Oh, my gosh. We are talking about the horrors of Idaho folklore, cryptids of Idaho. We have Samuel Anderson. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Darren Young. Hello. <laughs> well, that was so spooky. <laughs> <laughs> and JC Brain. Hi, everybody. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, coming on the show. You've been working so hard on all this. Who wants to start tonight? I think I am, actually. First of all, thanks for having us. The subject of Idaho folklore actually came up just through... Uh, Darren's interest in uh, in one of the particular cryptids, and so we uh, got into uh, got into this research a little bit. And when I say we, I mean mostly Sam and Darren. Uh, but I'm gonna um, I'm gonna join you guys to uh, to talk about kind of why this stuff is so cool. And uh, you mean to scare the listener, right? Exactly. Okay. Good. Exactly. And so, uh, you know, the subject is is different than normal. You know, obviously, there's no shortage of scary stories, you know, that you can tell of involving the the penitentiary and the uh, um, not just, you know, ghosts, but, you know, scary real life stuff, right? But instead of, uh, you know, going back to the ghost story as well for this one, I um, decided to look into some historic cryptids some historic monsters that uh you know may or may not exist around idaho yeah so f- just a just a quick question for those who may not know aka me um what is a cryptid is that just another word for monster is there something that differentiates a cryptid from a monster that's a great question sky and we'll talk a little bit about this some more but a cryptid or a cryptozoology is kind of the modern biology of monsters it's kind of a fringe pseudoscience where people are looking into um, what they believe to be real monsters. So cryptids would be like Bigfoot, Loch Ness, Monster. And some of the creatures we're going to talk about tonight will be considered cryptids. Others are going to be a little bit more in the range of like folklore, mythology, stuff like that. Perfect. Thank you. You know, you might not uh, think of Idaho as having, you know, a history of this kind of spooky folklore. But, you know, we're surrounded by places that are known for it. The Pacific Northwest, um, you know, we're not technically part of the Pacific Northwest, but we're we're super close and sometimes included in that. And the Pacific Northwest is home to, to Sasquatch or Bigfoot. And uh, Bannock County, actually, Pocatello up in uh, northern Idaho is home to the Bigfoot rendezvous every year. Um, and so... Uh, so it's kind of like a little, a little Bigfoot convention that they uh, that they do up there, and then we're also you know near Wyoming and that part of the country too, where uh, where the jackalope hails from, right? The jackalope with uh, bunnies with antlers, and so uh, um, aren't those so real? of course 
Uh, yeah, I was going to say, what do you think? aren't they cute? There's like a Pixar short where it's just the great American jackalope, and he's awfully adorable. <laughs> if it's in Pixar, it must be true. <laughs> That's uh, from Pixar's line of documentaries, right? Um, and so... Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, Pixar, the classic documentary maker. Documentary filmmaking studio. Uh, <laughs> yes. So anyway, what ended up happening is uh ended up going on this little research tangent um, inspired by... Uh, Charlie, who's the um, the Paya Lake monster, and Charlie. these guys yeah. uncovered a ton of of different stories, and so narrowing it down was the hard part. Deciding which ones to use based on what might be most recognizable to the audience, of course, as you said, what's going to scare the audience most, right? And um, we narrowed it down to a top four uh, for this episode. So for the Halloween special, we're going to cover uh, Charlie, of course, the Camus Wildman, Ghost Miners, and then the Gaia Scudis. And that's just, you know, again, to represent a few of the possible mythology that you could cover in this subject without going into some of the topics that might be for another culture to tell. As Sam was saying, with uh, cryptozoology, uh, monster folklore dates back to uh, some of the earliest myths that um, have ever been documented. And so since the beginning, humans have peered out of the darkness and wondered what could be lurking there. Some of these tales were used to teach children morals. Some of them were uh, rules disguised as made-up stories to keep people safe, to keep people from wandering out where they're not supposed to be. And then, uh, you know, monster legends that uh, focus on education as well as entertainment. And so uh, there's plenty of these myths that acted as a way to explain the unknown, right? As sort of science branched off into pseudosciences and people kind of felt more comfortable developing their own scientific theories and not seeking out, you know, one particular channel of science in order to explore and create hypotheses on their own. That's where, you know, this cryptozoology came from, right? So the idea that uh, there's species out there that haven't been documented by mainstream science, and could that be because they don't actually exist? Or could it be because no one's just been able to to locate them because they're unique or because they are uh, evasive, right? And so the term cryptozoology, you know, everyone may not be super familiar with that term, but they could be, but they're usually familiar with an example of cryptozoology. So Bigfoot, sea monsters, right? Other examples could be, you know, the Jersey Devil, uh, the Mothman, jackalopes, right? Uh, Yetis and abominable snowmen, chupacabras, you know, those sorts of things that, uh, you know, usually have a root in a particular culture or a particular climate, right? Sky, do you have a a favorite cryptid? uh, I mean, I guess I can't say that I have done a lot of diving into uh, cryptids. I feel like I've listened to a couple episodes of like Mothman and that was super interesting. Mm -hmm. I do love the idea of the Loch Ness monster or just like sea monsters, like the Kraken. I think (laughs) I'm of the opinion that those may exist because the ocean is simply so deep that we have no idea what's down there. And I would genuinely prefer to explore space to sea. So (laughs) I'm going to say the Kraken also because the Seattle NHL team is called the Kraken, which is officially the coolest mascot (laughs) in all of sports. It's a pretty cool mascot. That's awesome. I pinned you down for a Yeti fan, but a yeti that's fair or like an abominable snowman but again only if it's the pixar kind he just seems so nice he just wants to serve everyone snow cones (laughs) sorry (laughs) anthony do you have a favorite cryptid yeah mothman definitely i have this may be an out like out there question i don't know if either any of you would know the answer to this are aliens considered cryptids that's a really good question and yeah most cryptozoologists do categorize aliens as part of that field of basically undiscovered biology and so yeah a lot of cryptozoologists are also alien hunters Uh, do with that information what you will 
I think we need to get uh, we need to start talking about some of the different stories. Yeah, all of the the research that uh, this team compiled and and uh, dug through in order to support these uh, these folk tales and these stories through a historic narrative that includes people's experiences that were documented was done through several different sources. And so that includes newspapers.com, Chronicling America, the Idaho Statesman's online archives, among other sources. So yeah, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Darren. Okay, I'm going to start with uh, arguably the most popular Idaho cryptid. And it should be right up your alley, Sky, because it is a lake monster. It's <laughs> Also, probably the least frightening out of the four that we are going to take a look at. Unless you're afraid of deep water, then it's probably the most frightening to you. So (laughs) it could go either way for me. Yeah, it could. I'll I'll let you decide at the end. (laughs) Okay, I'll let you know. If you've ever visited the central Idaho town of McCall, chances are you've heard of this local legend, possibly through someone who's seen the monster with their own eyes. According to the legend, a 35-foot-long lake monster named Charlie resides in the waters of the Payette Lake. The monster is believed to have three to four humps, a shell-like back, range from pale yellow to brownish-green in color, and have a head like a submarine periscope. For anyone who isn't familiar with the Payette Lake area, this body of water is a deep mountain lake located in Ponderosa State Park. Tall pine trees border the lake and make it a beautiful scenic location to enjoy camping and water sports. While the legend of Charlie the Payette Lake Monster is one mostly celebrated by the McCall community and known amongst Idahoans, its popularity once exceeded what it is today. During the mid-20th century, tales of Idaho's Loch Ness Monster appeared in newspapers across the country with article titles such as, Idaho has a real sea serpent. What color is Idaho's new sea serpent? And Charlie slithers into sights of McCall monster watchers. Perhaps the trickiest part of uncovering the history of Charlie is narrowing down the monster's possible birthday. Charlie's name appears in many newspaper articles throughout the 1940s and 50s. However, several articles claim this monster made an annual appearance every summer, beginning sometime between 1918 and 1920. The tricky part about Charlie's first appearance is that although locals claimed sightings began around this time, Monster's popularity may not have been intense enough to plaster tales of its existence in the newspapers. Something occurred in the 1930s that changed the game for Lake Monsters, and that was Scotland's Loch Ness Monster and its rise in fame. 1933 was a big year for Nessie, and as tales of this creature circulated around the globe, the fascination with aquatic monsters grew, and understandably, many people wanted to see one of these creatures with their own eyes. In 1937, an article titled Wanted, a Sea Monster appeared in the Idaho Statesman suggesting a sea serpent be planted into Lake Payette to draw people to the area. This article states, Residents of the state have awakened to the fact that they can do something about telling the world of Idaho's natural resources and wonders. Outdoor enthusiasts thrive in Idaho. We have good fishing, hunting, skiing, sightseeing camping, and so many more activities that draw tourists to different areas throughout the state. However, according to this article, the efforts to advertise the beauty of Payet Lake, including its potential for seasonal outdoor activities, wasn't drawing enough attention at the time. Perhaps McCall needed a stronger hook. We can find a monster in the Payet Lake, the article reads. England's Loch Ness Monster drew hundreds of tourists. Why can't McCall import some kind of a sea serpent all her own and plant it in the lake this summer? Something like a giant sea cow or a sea elephant. I know why she has something as, cute. As, I don't as, know, but also as if these things just exist. Like, oh, of course, the local sea cow population. Let's just go get a big one. Like, <laughs> they can. They make it, it seem out. so easy. I feel like it would deter me from jumping into this or going to this lake. But... Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. Also, what is a sea elephant? Is it a seal or a, like a sea lion? Honestly, a sea cow and sea elephant all just sounds like a manatee to me, but I'm I'm not entirely sure at this point. <laughs> I love this already. <laughs> but according to the legend, though, Payet Lake already had the monster. Its existence just needed to be broadcast. In 1942, the lake monster finally made an appearance in the Idaho Statesman. Two years later, it appeared in newspapers across the state and then across the country making 1944 a very popular year for Charlie. 
Now, I've been referring to the monster as Charlie, but at this point, it didn't actually have a name. People referred to the serpent as Slimy Slim, the Twilight Dragon, and most commonly, it was simply the Payette Lake Monster or Payette Sea Serpent. <laughs> slimy Slim. Yeah, that was a slimy. common one. And That's I, incredible. Anthony, that has to be a new nickname. <laughs> that was probably its most common name up until when it actually got its name. But I, I think it's very interesting how it's always referred to um, as Payette Sea Serpent when it's clearly a lake. But several variations of the legend circulated and sightings included some wildly different observations regarding the monster's appearance. However, it could be agreed upon that the monster appeared in the summer. And as Dick DeEsom, an information officer for Idaho's game department, wrote in an Idaho Statesman article from August 6, 1944, at no time, it should be emphasized, has anyone claimed or suggested that the monster breathes fire? So this is strictly a water monster. It's not some sort of fire-breathing dragon. Deesum also mentions in the article that the monster is never spotted in multiple places at once. Therefore, it couldn't have been a prearranged coincidence. While the physical descriptions of the lake monster vary, the consensus is that it is roughly 35 feet long, although several witnesses claim it's closer to 60 feet. Its body ranges from pale yellow to brownish green with a shell-like back. It has humps like a camel and is most commonly seen with a head like a submarine periscope. Its head also has been described as that of a bulldog, a pig, and a head with ears like a lynx. Descriptions of sightings and quotes from witnesses appeared in many newspaper articles released throughout the summer of 1944. Some of my personal favorites come from an article found in the San Francisco Examiner titled, What Color is Idaho's New Sea Serpent? McCall resident Walter Bowling states, I was on my dock and it came to within 80 feet of the shore. It was about 35 feet long. It was light yellow and seemed to have humps like a camel, a shell-like back, but no scales. Mrs. Eaton from Emmett, Idaho added, it's the way it wiggles in the water that makes people think it has humps. It's a snaky kind of creature, dark green, about the green of an apple tree leaf. At one point, it lifted its head at least two feet above the water. This last quote I'm going to share from the article begins to dive into the discussion about possible theories of what the monster might actually be. Boise resident John F. Brown states, There isn't a doubt that this illusion is in reality a bunch of beaver pulling and pushing a big log through the water. <laughs> three or four beaver pulling the log with two or three others pushing and a couple pulling can stir up a lot of splashing. What? kind of organized beaver group is this like i was gonna say his like confidence in the fact that it is just a bunch of beavers moving a log <laughs> is astounding yeah there is not a doubt in this man's mind there is, is no beaver. doubt that the it's great, just a bunch of beavers you weirdos the great mccall beaver circus like <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, i love it <laughs> attributing this legend to a handful of beavers is certainly one of the more unique theories an article from the Salt Lake Tribune released on August 6th that summer mentioned several other theories for the lake monster, such as a mother otter swimming with little otters, a log with ducks on it, a freshwater porpoise who somehow reached the lake long ago and got walled in, and arguably the most common theory is a sturgeon. Sturgeon are found in Idaho's lakes and rivers and they grow to be quite large. Not exactly 35 feet long, but long enough that if you spot part of a large sturgeon above the water, it could be pretty frightening. A squawfish or a school of squawfish is another theory, although these fish do not grow as large as sturgeon do. And if the existence of a lake monster isn't exciting enough, some people believed the creature might actually be an Elasmosaurus, which is a marine dinosaur from the late Cretaceous period that has a long neck and giant flippers. Although this species is extinct, some people believe that this dinosaur could live in the deep mountain lake. But how, like, how has it survived this long? All of the theories I've read about the Elasmosaurus living in Payette Lake is that it's just deep enough that it could basically house one of these dinosaurs because they have to live in, in a really deep lake. And because it was formed from a glacier, it's deep enough. How has it survived in terms of, like, 
the length of time. I mean, we we don't really know how old <laughs> Charlie is or when Charlie was born. So Charlie could very well be 2,000 years old. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that's so interesting. With all of these theories considered, the possibility remains that the creature is nothing short of a lake monster. By January 1954, McCall's biggest celebrity finally got a name. Augie Boone McCallum, publisher of the Payette Lake Star, started a naming contest in the newspaper, offering a $5 prize for the best name submitted by December 31st, 1953. Word of this contest quickly spread across the country, and by the end of the month, Names were submitted from Delaware, Virginia, and Rhode Island, along with the many Idaho submissions. Rhode Island? Rhode Island. Wow. Now wait till you hear where the, where the winner came from. When judges chose the best name in January, the prize money increased to $40, with cash prizes given to second, third, and fourth place winners. So, Sky and Anthony, do either of you yes. want to try to guess how much $40 would be today? Like $500. $420. That's so close. Nice. I cheated. I looked over. Yeah, it, it, it's you actually... Oh, I thought you were. Yeah, I literally... Yeah, I didn't know like, you were going to say something that close. I was hoping you guys would be really far off, but... <laughs> the 50s is the only decade I've actually figured out. It's about 10 times the amount, but any other decade I would have been done for. Yeah, you're really close, so I actually feel like you should win this one because you were really close and you didn't cheat. And um, I didn't cheat. You didn't cheat. It's true. Cheaters never prosper. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so it is actually about $440, which is a lot for a naming contest prize. Wow, yes it is. That's awesome. Like, And then to like name this lake monster, you get to carry that with the rest, you know, the rest of your life. That's really cool. The top prize went to Lay Isle Hennifer Turry of Springfield, Virginia, for the name Charlie. Virginia. All the way from Virginia. Yeah. Second place went to Mrs. Isabel McGregor of McCall for the name Boone. Oh, she wins everything. Third went to <laughs> Helga M. Cook of McCall for the name Finnegan. And fourth place went to Mrs. Willard Boydston of Baker, Oregon, for the name Watsit. Like a wh- like what's it? Who's it? Yeah, it's spelled like W A T Z I T. Okay, I like Finnegan. That's a sweet. Finnegan is so cool. Yeah, that's a good one. There, Missed opportunity. Think... Oh, there, the newspaper article for this lists all almost all of the entries too. So there were definitely yeah. some cool ones. What was the craziest one you saw? Actually, I'm about to say four of them. Yes. So there were some interesting names that weren't considered because they were too long. Macallosaur, Phantasmagoria, Periscope Pete, and the Pegasus of Payette Lakes are just a few of these. Oh. And Macallosaur is definitely my favorite. Yeah. But they were just too long. This naming contest was a big event for McCall. The judges for the contest included Governor Len Jordan, State <laughs> Senator Frank Freeman, State Representative Ralph Paris, and several members of the McCall community. Following the contest, the lake monster experienced a renewed wave of popularity similar to that of 1944, but this time the name Charlie appeared in the newspapers, giving the lake monster a permanent identity. Charlie's popularity died down following the 1950s, but its name was seen and heard occasionally throughout the 60s and 70s. In 1964, an Idaho Statesman article titled, Charlie Slithers into Sights of McCall Monster Watchers, claims, Hardly a season has passed since 1920 that Charlie hasn't turned up, indicating that despite the monster's fall from stardom, it continued to make annual appearances. By the late 1970s, lingering tales of Charlie occasionally drew in tourists, such as Jack Murphy, who wrote in his article titled, Idaho's version of Loch Ness Monster, found in the Newark Advocate, that Charlie was responsible for his journey to McCall, although he never saw the serpent. Due to the monster's lack of publicity during the last 50 years, Charlie is mostly known by local Idahoans. The McCall community continues to celebrate the legend of Charlie by incorporating the lake monster into community events such as McCall's Winter Carnival, where spectators will almost always see an eye sculpture depiction of Charlie. Oh, so cool. Too. Yeah, they, they're they huge, too. They're huge. Yeah. yeah. Everybody should go to that. Charlie is such an interesting cryptid to analyze because there are so many theories associated with this lake monster. It's quite challenging at this point to uncover where exactly this creature originated. 
whether it was an advertising scheme, an aquatic animal, or truly a 35-foot-long lake serpent, Charlie was once one of the most popular lake monsters in the United States and continues to be a fun um, or possibly frightening story, depending on how it's told. (laughs) Charlie might be the most famous Idaho lake monster, but the waters are not the only place you need to watch. Our forests are also full of things that go bump in the night. The question you have to ask yourself is, which ones are friendly and which ones are not? Let's pass it over to Samuel to hear about the Camas Wild Man. Can I ask first, though, how many of you have gone to McCall and, like, played in the pay Like, and, and, Oh, I have. Yeah. Totally. Are you all aware of the Charlie cryptid? Were you mm-hmm. before you did no. this research? I had no idea about this. Um, I actually found a Charlie post on Reddit, and that's what got me looking into it. But then I started asking around, and in my hometown, in Mountain Home, Idaho, there are people that have talk to me about this and they fully believe that charlie exists in paya lake and there's so many people i've talked to that have seen charlie have you i've never seen charlie but i heard i i knew about the myth growing up um i'm of course from the east side of the state but like something i i heard people talking about the legendary lake monster of mccall mm-hmm. jc have, did you know about charlie i did but just from uh Hearing about it from these guys, mm, yeah. yeah. I definitely knew about Charlie and had have witnessed the ripples. And I've I was with locals when I was playing some music at at uh, Shore Lodge. You know, looks over the lake and um, the singer. She was just like, "There goes Charlie!" And we saw this like snaky kind of ripple through the through the lake. And everybody like went out to look, and that was my first introduction into it. So. This is so cool. Like, I, I didn't know any of this lore behind it in that other people, you know, the sightings have been going on for 100 years since 1918. Is that around yeah. that time that people It might have been sooner. This? Yeah, right. The yeah. documented cases. Yeah, that that's so cool. In your experience, um, when you saw the ripples, were there any beavers present? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, were they pushing logs? Was it otters and her babies? <laughs> I didn't see any uh, beavers. Uh, no, but uh, I love the idea of imagining them all underwater, like doing <laughs> it's the cutest idea for sure. Um, <laughs> man, amazing job. Nice work, Darren. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Now let's get scary. Let's get spooky. <laughs> It's late fall 1982. Two cowboys search the Camas Prairie, looking for cattle they'd lost in the storm the night before. They better find those cows fast, because if another storm rolls in, this time it might bring snow, changing the forest floor of autumn leaves into a blanket of white. But as they ride around the bend, they do not find their cattle, but something else entirely. Standing in front of them is an enormous monster, The beast gave out a warning snarl to the cowboys before dashing off into the wilderness. The men mustered their courage, drew their revolvers, and gave chase. For some time, the cowboys went after the bounding beast, but the monster was too fast, and eventually it escaped, leaving nothing but the echo of its terrible growl in its wake. Later, after returning back to town, the men would describe the monster in great detail. Here are some of the highlights of that description. Quote, The wild man is considerably over six feet in height, with great muscular arms which reached to his knees. The muscles stood out in great knots, and his chest was as broad as that of a bear. All parts of his body to be seen were covered by long black hair. His eyes shone brightly while two tusks protruded from his mouth. His fingers were the shape of claws. The Cowboy's Encounter was published in November of 1882 by the Haley Times. This story did not stop there, but rather snowballed into a mass hysteria spreading through the state and eventually through the rest of the country. Between organized hunting parties, supposed monster slayings, and rivaling newspaper publishers, 
the Camas Wild Man would become one of the strangest chapters of Idaho history, begging the citizens to ask what's fact and what's fiction when it comes to the question of who is the Camas Wild Man. I, I I have a question for all of you. If you were confronted by a six foot man with tusks growing out of his mouth, would you chase after it? Because I would not. If you were an Idaho cowboy, you'd have to. Before we dive into the story of the beast, let's talk about what a wild man is in mythology. In folklore, wild men range from mountain men all the way to human animal hybrids. They're viewed as out of touch with the civilized world and yet at one with nature. This folklore is common in many cultures throughout all of history, but we do see an increase of these stories in medieval Europe. These tales would eventually travel to America by European immigrants. In 1958, we would get the most famous cryptid of all time with the first reports of Bigfoot in California. Now, whether Bigfoot would be considered a wild man is somewhat of a complicated subject. While Bigfoot has many of the wild man's characteristics, some historians categorize them separately because Bigfoot is believed to be an unknown species as opposed to a man turned wild as a result of supernatural or natural factors. Bigfoot may act as our current version of the wild man, but as far as monsters go, Bigfoot is considered to be relatively modern of a legend. Now the situation is even more complicated when you factor in indigenous beliefs. The tribes of America have rich mythologies and spiritual beliefs, some of which include hairy men like monsters. Most commonly brought up in this context is the Sasquets from the Chahalis people. Interestingly enough, Sasquets is also where we get the modern Anglized term Sasquatch. There are also belief systems about the Wendigo from the Algonquai people. While these stories do have similarities with Wild Man, it would be a grievous error in order to try and say they're the same creature. Many Bigfoot enthusiasts try to use these myths to validate their own claims. However, this is often considered disrespectful and an oversimplification of these beliefs. Nevertheless, it is without a doubt that indigenous beliefs have influenced the mythology of early settlers as well as modern pop culture. Because of all of these factors, the Idaho Wild Man was not the first of its kind, but rather a long, enduring folklore archetype. These creatures were at the forefront of the nation's collective mind. For example, reports came out earlier in 1882 of the Pyramid Wild Man of Nevada. After the Camas Wild Man, there would also be reports of the California Wild Man, the Hyena Wild Man from Kentucky, and a wild woman in North Carolina. Still, the Camas Wild Man was one of the most significant because of its national attention. The Haley Times report of the monster would be published on November 1st. By the 15th, news of the beast had spread from Salt Lake all the way to San Francisco. The fame of our monster would grow exponentially after the Chicago Times would publish a full-page illustration of the Camas Wild Man confronting the two cowboys. Meanwhile, back in Idaho, the locals were getting nervous. News of a monster is entertaining when you're hundreds of miles away, but when it's at your back door, it's an entirely different story. Homesteaders speculated that this behemoth might account for their stolen property and missing calves. The cowboys who first saw the beast described it as terrifying, but not necessarily as threatening. Still, this did little to dispel the fear of the Idaho settlers. The question was, how long would it be into this beast's appetite grew from cattle to human? Frontiersmen would gather guns, and the hunt for the Camas Wild Man would officially begin. As more settlers went on the hunt, sightings of the beast became more frequent. Reports started to pour in, not just from the greater Sawtooth area, but from across the entire state. He would be described frequently as covered in hair, brandishing sharp claws, jagged fangs, and, quote, presenting a most horrible appearance. While descriptions of his height vary drastically from six feet tall to, quote, humbug as big as a sawtooth cave, all did seem to agree that he was massive. The Camas Wild Man would cause discussion and debate throughout the region. Some claimed that he was the missing link between humans and primates. Others said that he was a homeless man who used to work for a stagecoach driver. No one could even agree on when he'd first been sighted. 
with some pages claiming reports dated back to 1873. A group found what they suspected to be the wild man's den, but it contained no dead cattle, but rather just berries and cheese. The need for a hunt in the first place was drawn into question. Was this berry and cheese loving creature actually dangerous enough to hunt down and kill? Despite all these debates, the hunt would continue. For listeners who are sensitive to violence, I might skip ahead about 90 seconds. Now, unlike many of the other men in Idaho, James McKinley was not hunting for the beast. He was just simply camping in the woods with his friend John Minier. A hungry James decided to leave camp looking for a duck or some sort of other game for dinner. On that cold winter day, James was not the hunter, but rather the hunted. Before he even lost sight of the camp, the Camus wild man pounced. James reacted on pure instinct, pulling his shotgun to the ready. The monster gave, quote, a shriek that struck terror to the hunter and caused him to shudder as the echo resounded through the forest. But James, knowing it might mean life or death, regained his composure and fired the shotgun into the chest of the Camus wild man. The giant crashed to the forest floor. James ran over and seeing that somehow the monster had survived the direct blast, put his foot on its neck and called to John to bring him the axe. The beast threw him off and regained his feet. The monster tried to flee, but by now James had the axe. Quote, The axe was thrown at him, and as he turned his head to look back, it struck him in the center of the forehead, and he dropped lifeless to the ground. The reign of terror was over. James McKinley had finally slayed the beast. The fame the Camus Wildman had achieved in his life was nothing compared to the notoriety he would gain in death. The Bellevue Sun's article detailing the killing would be republished all across the country. During the next four months, hundreds of reprints would appear, not just in the majority of western states, but also appearing as far east as Kentucky. Maine, Mississippi, Illinois, Missouri, North Carolina, South Carolina, Vermont, and Washington, D.C. West Virginia specifically was especially enamored by the case, having more articles about this Western adventure than any other state outside of the West. Back in Idaho, feelings about the Camus Wild Man's death were a little more complicated. Some papers denied the slain. Others mocked it. The Idaho Semi-Weekly of Idaho City would accuse the story of being entirely fictional. Quote, A recent issue of the Bellevue Sun of the killing of the wild man of Camus was made of whole cloth. On the other hand, James McKinley would later be fined $25 for killing a deer out of season. He would not be fined, however, for monster slain by the game officers because, quote, There was no law against killing the wild man. Woods River, another Haley newspaper, would be the most bitter about the report. The publisher was furious at Alec, the author of the Bellevue Times article, who had, quote, killed the wild man of Camus and thus idiotically robbed the press. He went on to say, <laughs> It must have been a silly noodle like the sun man that killed the goose that laid the golden eggs. <laughs> As that back and forth between the Idaho papers continued, it became more and more apparent that Haley had been hoping the Camus Wild Man would lead to sold papers, summer tourism, and monster fame. Eventually, Picotti, editor of the Haley Times, would be credited with the origin of the myth. In the years to follow, Camus Wild Man would first become something of a joke. There would be a brief resurgence of Camus Wildman discussion after Bigfoot would rise to fame, but as the years went on and those who participated in those Camus Wildman hunts began to die off, his story was all but forgotten. Nowadays it's hard to even find Google search results of a creature which once thrilled and terrified the entire nation. Now comes the real question. What really happened and who was the Camus Wildman? There are three major theories to explain this phenomenon. First, and most generally accepted, was the entire story's fictional. From start to finish, it was all an elaborate prank, a hoax for the sole purpose of tourism. Second, there really was something out there. 
a monster, an unidentified species, or maybe just a misidentified animal. But encounters with the creature were exaggerated and repurposed for profit. This is the theory that most cryptozoologists would argue, that there really was something out there that started the legend. Option three, and by far the most unnerving, was the monster was not a monster at all, but rather a homeless man living in the woods. There's actually a surprising amount of evidence to support this theory. It might seem far-fetched, but we do actually have similar examples. During the 1880s, an old prospector named Riley would be found in the Idaho wilderness, naked and acting animal-like. <laughs> Riley would be cleaned up, bathed, shaved, and taken to a mental institution. With that in mind, things like the stolen property and the den containing cheese and berries seem more like the work of a man than a monster. Most damning of all is the description of the body brought back by James McKinley. The body was described as a man. A man in great need of a barber, but a man nonetheless. He was described as a Caucasian male, about 45 years old, dressed in animal pelts. He had long, wavy black hair and a thick beard. His hands were described as having long fingernails. Not claws, but just long, crusty nails. No fangs were mentioned at all in the description. Perhaps a much more terrifying idea than a monster lurking in the woods is that the Camus Wild Man was actually just a homeless man who was killed in a panic brought on by mass hysteria. In the end, we will never know the truth behind the Camus Wild Man. While I think you can make a strong case for all three of these theories, I think the most likely reality is some sort of combination there was undeniably sensationalism and deception by the newspapers, but I don't know that if that alone could dismiss all the eyewitness reports by local hunters. Whether the Camus Wild Man was real or not is debatable. What isn't debatable is the impact the story had. The hunting parties organized to find the beast, the fear felt by the locals, the mass hysteria which spread throughout the United States. Could the Camus Wild Man still exist today? As historians, we best leave that to the speculation of cryptozoologists and to campfire stories. But, the next time you're out in the woods, you're alone and it's dark out, and somewhere behind you, you hear a twig snap, something rustling through the bushes, and you wonder what's out there. You can decide for yourself what you believe. We've talked about monsters who've lurked in the woods as well as some in the water, but for the next school, JC's going to have us venture deep under the Earth's crust, because that is where we will find the ghost miner. Ooh, very Ooh, cool. Uh, well, wow. Wow. I was wow. going to say. A spooky. To live up to that. As we all know, Idaho was built on mining as an industry, right? And... You know, that, uh, that came with a lot of hazards, right? Um, there's uh, just mining it traditionally is not the, uh, the safest for the weak or for the, the faint of heart, right? And so I think that's where uh, a lot of this, uh, this folklore surrounding mining comes from and why there have been a series of, uh, of mining apparitions that have been reported through Idaho's history of press and storytelling, right? And so I'm going to talk about a few of those different stories, starting um, a little bit, though, with, uh, with some background. In 1890, the Wood River Times published a series of mining aphorisms, including, Ghosts in a mine can work no evil, but spirits below play the devil. Idaho obviously has a rich history of uh, ghost folklore. And so we decided uh, to devote some time to talk about the ghost miner, not necessarily one story from any specific part of the state, but more of a representational figure of 160 years of tales of haunted mines in Idaho. Gold was discovered in Idaho in 1860, and the influx of miners into the territory would be instrumental in the growth and development of the state. 
However, mining has always come with its fair share of occupational hazards, like I said, right? Injury and death are quite common in the industry, especially during the territorial days. Factor into this the many superstitions that miners adopted to cope with their everyday dangers and tragedies, and you find a wide collection of haunted mines spread throughout the state. There are a lot of examples here that we can pull from. Between Boise and Idaho City, there's a quartz mine called the Gambler's Ghost. The name of the mine dates as far back to the 1880s, and supposedly was given to the mine in order to warn of the phantom who haunts it. Though there's some historical speculation that its name was actually a tribute to a popular racehorse, it's more common than one might expect to... Um, pin down that uh, these named ghost stories uh, came as a result of people trying to explain the name, rather. And so near Silver City, the Golden Chariot Mine is said to be haunted by the spirit of a man named John C. Holgate. Holgate fought and died protecting the mine in the Chariot Elmore War of 1868, and that was a battle between two different uh, mines, the Golden Chariot and the Ida Elmore mines the locals believed he continued to defend it long after he died in that battle and so it was less than two years after holgate died when other miners began to see his apparition roaming through the dark shafts the local newspaper the avalanche reported that miners would be working in one of the tunnels only to round a quarter and then find holgate's spirit just standing there alone in the darkness one man would say he saw John Holgate standing in the empty passage, his ghostly lips moving as if speaking, but the specter made not a sound. Oh, this sounds like visitor experiences here at the old pen. Right. right. Absolutely not. I would hate every moment of that. Oh, <laughs> me too. And how tortured of a soul must he be if the best place for him is a mine? Yeah. Well, you know I mean, what I mean? Like, oh, man. Same reason people would haunt a prison, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't. You, if you've got unfinished business or if you. Yeah. I love, like, going into caves. I mean, I haven't gone in any mine shafts, but usually it's with the idea that it's just me. And to run into anybody down in a cave is it's a really scary experience. It's very strange. Like, the Cuna Caves, just like wandering through that. And you get to a cavern and there's somebody in there like, oh, oh, man. See, I can't even do the tunnels here. Anthony has gone down into the tunnels underneath uh, some of these prison buildings and there is no way. Oh, there is no way. Tunnels? I love it. So last summer, uh, my family and I went up to Wallace and there is a mine there that you can actually go into and tour. It used to be active. It's, it's not anymore, but there's a point where the tour guide turns out the lights that we have. And when I tell you that it is a darkness, I have never experienced before in my life to then think about these things are barely lit as it is. And you come around a corner and there's just a literal ghost there. I would leave and never come back. So scary. Just the thought of it makes my eyes water. Mm -hmm. I mean, it gets worse because the uh, um, (laughs) great guy who, you know, shared his experience with this apparition said that uh, he used his thin bony hand to beckon the man to come closer. But he didn't approach Holgate's ghosts. Instead, he he ran. He turned around, fled as fast as he could. Like a normal person. Yeah, as the, as a person should. <laughs> you know, West Idaho is not the only part of the state that could boast having cursed mining shafts. Stories of mining spirits can be found anywhere where, you know, mines exist. So in 1891, as more stories spread through the state, uh, strange occurrences in uh, the Butte County mines the spokane review stated at the time butte has a haunted mine haunted presumably by the disgrace of being in butte <laughs> well, well. shots fired at butte dang wow so, shots fired. Uh, couldn't, Shame. how could you leave that out they're poking fun at one another <laughs> the other stories were uh were much less of a laughing matter so there's the uh the ghost of Boulder Creek Cave, the Boulder Creek Revenant. In the fall of 1882, two prospectors were crossing the Sawtooth Mountains on their way home to Wood River. They were somewhere between the east and north fork of Salmon River. When thunder cracked and the sky let loose its fury, 
The two men rushed to find shelter as the pounding rain turned to heavy snow. And then when all hope seemed lost, they found a cave. Just an opening in the side of the mountain. They scrambled up to this uh, sanctuary that they found and they were able to escape from the howling storm. Once inside, they found the cave. It wasn't just big, it was enormous. Undeterred, they were just grateful to be out of the elements, so they, they stuck it out, they made a fire, they cooked dinner, they sat and waited for the storm to pass. And after some time emboldened with boredom, the two decided to explore. They used the flickering light of their torches to penetrate deeper into the darkness. And then uh, the article that was describing their adventure said uh, there were quartz crystals which glisten like diamonds, massive columns of stalactites. In the very center of this cave there was a lake with water that was as black as ink. And then the joy of the men, uh, the beauty of the cave came to an abrupt end when they discovered a body. They could tell the body had been there a long time. Couldn't, you know, tell how long the body had been there, but uh, all that was left was the skeleton. And the two prospectors approached the skeleton. The remains gave no sign of a cause of death. Behind them, the storm gave out, um, and the two men left. They spun around, and they turned back, and instead of just a skeleton, they saw the whole phantom. Staring at them, standing right in front of them, eyes glowing in the darkness, watching them as they ran. The sound that came from the dead revenant made the prospector's hair stand on end. They uh, summed up this with uh, article with a statement. Both men were transfixed with terror and would doubtless be there yet gazing in dumb fright at the apparition had not the terrible noise been repeated. When with one impulse, both men ran out the door so fast that they lost their hats. They ran from the cave, never went back. After they reported what they saw in town, a search party was formed to go back to the cave, but with no success. Two prospectors refused to accompany them back, and then um, they never found the skeleton. Uh, man. Oh, that's gross. Like, do you know how scary something has to be to, like, affect like these hardened miners who <laughs> for a living just choose to possibly encase themselves in the earth. That's not something that is just like, Oh, you're just afraid of a little skeleton. That's terrifying. So, I mean, obviously yeah. there's no, no explanation really further from this. You know, what did the bones belong to a miner who died from an injury or exposure? Were the, you know, was it something more sinister? Was it someone who was murdered after discovering gold and then left behind but the cave of boulder creek now belongs to the ghost miner all right so i think we've got one more right and sam's going to talk about the uh, ballad of fiddle kelly and the guy scudus now the hunters of oregon city had made a horrible mistake so much planning and energy had been put into catching the monstrosity but now that they finally did have the devil in captivity, they had absolutely no idea what to do next. The monster's cage began to shake violently. It would not be able to hold the beast much longer. They needed a plan, and fast, or the guy Scudis was going to break free. You all might be asking yourself, what in the world is a guy Scudis? And you would not be alone. Unlike the other, more recognizable monsters we've discussed today, the guy Scudis is virtually unknown. Modern cryptozoologists do in fact have a reptilian-like monster they refer to by that name, but it differs so much from the Idaho slash Oregon version that I don't plan on wasting any time with comparisons. The Morning Astorian of Oregon in 1883 would refer to it as, quote, a strange fierce animal, half grizzly, half human. The Idaho statesman in 1879 would report a much different description. Quote, the guy Scudis was described as twice as large as the largest sized grizzly bear and appearing to be a cross between the gorilla and hyena, with the fore and hind legs on one side about a foot shorter than those on the other, which enables him to travel rapidly on the steep sides of mountains. Well, the physical descriptions varied, there was one thing these reports all shared. Unlike the previous monsters who ranged from harmless to questionably threatening, 
There was no doubt in anyone's mind the violence the guy Scudis was capable of. The Idaho statesman would claim the beast had killed at least three men and a dozen dogs. It seems that the guy Scudis was a man-eater. Now, these events took place in Oregon City in 1850, a full decade before gold was discovered in Idaho, the little village of Oregon City already had a population of 697. Despite being one of the largest settlements in the area at the time, it was only a speck in the landscape of trees. The Idaho statesman would explain, quote, the village was surrounded by dense forests of fir and pine in which roamed at will every description of wild beast, from the huge grizzly bear and California lion to the beautiful and fragrant skunk. But, as these homesteaders soon discovered, these woods contained more than just beautiful skunks. They would also be occupied by the guy Scudis. After this monster began to terrorize the local mining community, a band of hunters joined together to protect their homes and their mining claims. But as the hunters came closer to capturing their quarry, the goal began to shift. What if instead of slaying the beast, they captured it? A captured guy Scudis must be worth a dozen gold mines. After some elaborate planning, these fearless men were finally able to do the impossible and capture the elusive and deadly Guy Scudis. But after its capture, the men soon came to understand how flimsy and dangerous of a situation they placed themselves in. They needed to either tame or kill the beast. If they failed, they were all going to die once it managed to free itself. The hunters needed some serious help. They needed Fiddle Kelly. Now, John Kelly was a traveling musician who mesmerized everyone who heard him. In December of 1879, in anticipation for Fiddle Kelly's upcoming Boise concert, the Idaho statesman would proclaim, The world-renowned musical monarch who has enchanted millions of the human race with the magic strains of melody that flowed obedient to the charmed touch of his bow, both in Europe and America, and today he looks almost as young as when we last saw him. Fiddle Kelly's skills were nothing short of astonishing. Could his fiddle enchant the beast the way it had enchanted hundreds of pioneers? If anyone could do it, it would be Fiddle Kelly. The Showdown It was a beautiful autumn day when the hunters rolled Guy Scudis' covered cage into town, where a makeshift stage fully equipped with an orchestra led by Fiddle Kelly was already waiting. The ever-savvy hunters charged admission to the musical showdown. Quote, Tickets went off like hotcakes at prices that would now seem fabulous. But despite this, the entire town was in attendance. Would Fiddle Kelly be able to tame the beast, or would he fail and everyone would die as a result? A hush fell over the crowd. Then, Fiddle Kelly began to play. The rest of the band joined in to a joyful jig. But as the group played on, the monster began to snap its teeth and then began to growl. The audience became nervous. The band attempted to increase pace, but this only upset the beast more. The chains began to rattle and the beast snarled in anger. A few witnesses began to drift away, putting a safer distance between themselves and the performance. But the band played on. The chains started to thrash violently, and this is when the crowd finally began to panic. Soon the entire audience was running for their lives. The cage rocked back and forth. Now band members, one by one, began to abandon the stage. Until it was just Fiddle Kelly who now played for his life. Quote, A most unearthly roar was heard. The chains which had bound the animal seemed to be broken to pieces, and the fragments thrown violently against the ceiling. A man ran around back yelling, Ladies and gentlemen, save yourselves out of the door for your lives! The guy Scudis is loose! The scene was absolute chaos, but Fiddle Kelly had the resolve of a gunslinger. He stood his ground, even as everyone else ran for the hills. The guy Scudis began to bend the bars on the cage. Someone yelled, People of Oregon City, for God's sake, save the great fiddler, save the brave leader of your orchestra, and don't leave him to be devoured by the monster. But no one heard the plea. 
it was too late. The monster leapt at Fiddle Kelly. Kelly dropped to the ground just in time for the beast to go sailing over his head, knocking over his fiddle. He threw both his hands over his head and waited for the onslaught of claws. But none came. Fiddle Kelly peeked through his fingers and saw the guy Scudis disappear into the woods, never to be seen again in Oregon City. Fiddle Kelly walked away without a scratch. The worst damage he took during the entire showdown with the monster was a fiddle that had been knocked out of tune. Now, you might think this is where the story would end, but it doesn't. Fiddle Kelly packed up his bags and continued on his western tour, but it followed, mostly out of sight, but never far behind. The guy Scudda stayed on the fiddler's trail. However, it wasn't after revenge or had any intention of hurting Fiddle Kelly. It just wanted to hear the music. Apparently the monster did enjoy the fiddle. Perhaps it just enjoyed it a little more when not chained and locked in a cage. However, the beast would not finish the musical tour. After Fiddle Kelly left Idaho, the beast remained behind in the woods surrounding Henry's Lake, where it supposedly remains to this day. Was that just the inspiration for the song, The Devil Went Down to Georgia? Seriously. <laughs> Hard not to make that comparison, right? The guy Scudis did not have many newspaper articles written about it, or for that matter, any widespread attention. Reported sightings are almost non-existent. Out of all the monsters we've talked about, the guy Scudis is the least like a cryptid and the most like a tall tale, a local legend used to entertain the community. Nevertheless, it's not to say that this story does not have any origin in reality. John Kelly was in fact a real person and a beloved fiddler. The Idaho statesman may have retold this story prior to his Boise concert as a way to either glorify or maybe even tease the fiddle master. In 1959, Idaho statesman would credit the entire tale as a practical prank pulled on the citizens of Boise. But... According to the morning historian, it really did happen. Kind of. Supposedly, Joe Meek, a webfoot pioneer in Oregon, invented the monster. In 1847, Joe would hold an event that would be somewhere between a prank and a scam. After starting rumors about the guy's goddess, Joe then claimed he'd captured it and planned to display it at a local log church. The guy Scudis was supposedly hidden behind the curtain. The massive audience could not see the beast, but they could hear the rattle of chains and growls. They never ended up seeing it either, because right before the creature was to be revealed, Joe ran around the curtain, covered in blood, and yelled to the audience, Save yourselves! The guy Scudis has broken loose! <laughs> as they panicked, and as the crowd ran home, Joe Meeks left town, his pockets stuffed full of the admission sales. He's a, he's a local P.T. Barnum. <laughs> What a con man. Genius con man. So, was Fiddle Kelly actually involved in this prank? Doubtful. A much more realistic explanation was the entire audience of the prank retold what they believed to have been a real monster encounter. By the 1870s, the folktale of the Guy Scudis was firmly set in Oregon and western Idaho. What better addition to the legend than a legendary fiddle player? However, there are some who would say Joe Meek's prank was just another scammer's attempt to capitalize off a real monster, maybe even inspired by real events. One hoax doesn't necessarily prove a creature does or does not exist. The guy Scudis may be an obscure monster, but some rumors of his existence remain, perhaps mostly told around campfires on the shores of Henry's Lake. Was the guy Scudis real? Like the rest of the creatures we've talked about today, we'll leave that up to the discretion of the audience. But fact or fiction, it makes for one entertaining story. In the myth, there is never any explanation given as to why the guy Scudis chose to stay behind at Henry's Lake. Maybe the beast just lost the scent of Fiddle Kelly. Perhaps Guy Scudis was tired of being a groupie. Or maybe it fell in love with the isolation of the rugged wilderness so far away from the humans with their iron chains and crowds of jeering spectators. It 
is conceivable that all the Guy Scudis ever wanted was to be left alone. Personally, I do have to wonder if the Guy Scudis ever gets lonely. They say that if you stand next to the lake on a clear, crisp night and play the fiddle, you can hear the Guy Scudis give you a mournful howl in reply. I didn't know about any of those. Cool new stories. Cool new things to think about the next time you're all out camping and enjoying yourself out in the wilderness, in the caves of Idaho, in the mines of Idaho. Uh, Spooky. Also, who drew the drawings? So we actually had one of our friends, uh, Draven Brown from Eastern Idaho. He does some graphic design work. And he ended up doing all of the monsters for us. The reason why he did the monsters for us is we're actually going to sell some of the stickers and uh, posters. And it's very possible we may have some very cool monster merch coming soon. Uh, I'll leave you in suspense about what that might end up being. Ooh, 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 they're very good. All credit to him. This was an excellent episode. I loved it. So much fun. Great work. Awesome research, great stories. We're bringing Idaho history, you know, to the to people and Idaho folklore and cryptids and spookiness too. So I learned a lot. Thank you. Anything else you all want to add? Well, I can't. Um, I can't speak for you because it seems like Sam, you had like an interest in this for quite a, a long time. This is like a pretty new like area from that I've been researching so but I've like found that I'm kind of like obsessed with it the joys of being a researcher right true <laughs> so when I found out that these guys had an interest in uh in looking into some of these stories basically you know I uh I thought what a great opportunity to uh not just co-opt some of these stories that are regional and do touch on Idaho but not not quite entirely but to develop our own, right? To tell some Idaho history that people definitely haven't heard of before, or at least aren't going to be super familiar with, and, you know, incorporate it into the fundraising mission too. So I'm excited to uh, to play with these designs and uh, get some stuff in the store right next to the Behind Gray Walls t-shirts and, uh, and stickers that we already offer. That's right. Hopefully our online store will have that up and you all can order your own t-shirt and stickers. Sam, do you have any any last insights? Anything? You know, only that this was so much harder to research than inmates. This this definitely is a little closer to my uh, origin of study, but like the inmates have like a direct end and a finish their stories and timelines. Like, these monsters, it took a tremendous amount of research. Darren put untold amounts of hours into this project. Mm -hmm. JC put a lot of work into this. I can't even tell you how messy it was to try and put together a story out of these articles from newspapers that are, like, battling for the most attention. Well, you did a great job of, uh, of trying to shore up some of these loose ends and make this into a nice, succinct, fascinating little little tale. All right, you guys, fantastic work. Uh, Darren, if I were to say do your own time, how would you respond to that? Bleh. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's a uh, goat, wow. <laughs> goat for do your Wait, own number. I can number. do a better one. That one was really bad, actually. Okay. Bleh. Oh, my gosh. JC, if I were to say do your own time, how would you respond to that? I'd probably say do your own number. Sam, how would you respond to do your own time? I would say do your own number and happy Halloween. Ooh. Wait, can Bye. you actually not put the goat noise in there? Why? <laughs> okay, because I didn't know there was an actual ending to that. I thought you were messing up the whole thing. Yeah, but I thought yeah, you were messing up. Yeah, that's how we know like, you don't listen. Do the crime or you do the time or something like that. So I was really confused. Yeah, Darren, how would you respond if you your own time? What is the actual response? Then? <laughs> <laughs> do your own number. <laughs> wow, she got it. She's no longer a goat. Aww. All right, everybody, do your own time. Do your own number and stay spooky. 
Stay spooky. We'll talk Stay to you next. Stay spooky. Night.